change, transformation. Do you run from it? Do you fear it? Are there times you want to embrace it? There's something deep inside, a desire, a longing, a thirst. Something deep in your soul that you can hardly put words to. Something that is hard to understand or even explain. It is a mystery. A mystery that extends an invitation to a journey. A journey to discover, deepen, and develop who you were created to be. Change. Transformation. Like clay, you are transformed by the touch of the master potter. Deep inside, your soul longs for the touch of the potter. The touch that shapes. A touch that reveals. A touch that knows who you are and the beauty you were created to be. Change. Transformation. Will you run from it? Will you fear it? Will you embrace it? Whenever we start thinking about pottery, and as Jeremiah is talking to us in Jeremiah chapter 18, the scripture says that the Lord told Jeremiah to go to the potter's house so I can show you something great. And there's times within our life where God has orchestrated us and put us at a certain time in a certain place so we could learn some things. Jeremiah is coming to this potter's house, and as he was at the potter's house, he saw the potter working clay on the wheel. And as he was watching the potter work the clay, he noticed that the potter saw that there was a mar, an imperfection. So because there was an imperfection, he started over. And he worked another beautiful pot and then it was beautiful and it was good he was satisfied with that pot I want to use the analogy today of clay and a potter to allow, to allow us to understand that God is in control of our life and God wants the best things for our life you know if you would look at a pot and how it has started it started with a clump of clay and the potter throws that clump of clay on a potter's wheel. And if you've never looked at a potter, whenever that clump of clay is on that potter's wheel, and that, that potter starts forming that pot, and, unless that pot is directly in the center of that wheel, it's going to wobble. And there's no way that potter will be able to make the pot until that clay is directly in the center of the potter's wheel. So the potter holds his hands tight and he forms it to the point where it is directly in center of that wheel. And when the clay becomes in the center of the wheel, that and that alone is the only time the potter will be able to form the pot because it is in the center. There's no wobbling going on within our life. The first analogy is this. Until we first put ourselves in the center of God's will, our life will be off kelter. We will be wobbling to and from, and we will never be satisfied because we feel like we're out of kelter. We feel like our life is out of control. We feel like things are taking place, that I am just not satisfied. I am not in control. So if there are things within our life that is out of control, the first thing that we have to do is we have to allow ourselves to be in the center of God's will. And you can't put yourself in the center of God's will. You have to allow God to move you into his will. It's his hand that takes you. It's his hand that centers you. And then after you're in the center of God's will, and that wheel is turning, and the pot is directly in the center, that's when God starts moving you, making you. You know, the clay has no decision on what it's going to become. Only the potter has the decision on how he's going to make that pot and what it's going to look like. But once that pot is in the center of the wheel, the potter can start forming that pot. It can make a vase. It can make a teacup. It can make any type of pot that it would because it's in his mind 
And he can create the pot for the purpose that he has designed it for. So it develops. It grows to whatever it could be. And then, in fully mature, he walks away saying, that's good. It is exactly how I want it to be formed. So he takes the pot and he cuts it off the wheel. And that's where a lot of us are right now. We feel like we have been fully matured. We feel like we've grown up. We've been in Christ. We go to church. We feel like that I've grown up and I know what God wants me to do. So he's taken me off that wheel. We say, oh, finally. Finally, it's over. Now I can be used of whatever God wants me to use. But then we find out that the potter is not done because the potter then throws us into a kiln. Anybody ever been in the kiln? He throws us in the kiln, and all of a sudden the heat is turned up, and we're on that pot, and we're thinking, turn off the stinking heat. It's hot in here. I don't want to do this anymore. I want to quit. But the potter says, oh, no, I'm not done with you yet. We stay in that hit kiln for sometimes hours until that pot has become thoroughly matured and hardened. And many of you will say, I've been in that kiln. I know what that kiln is like. I understand the heat. I understand the process. So the potter takes the pot out of the kiln. And then he says, oh, now I'm ready. I've gone through the heating process. But now the potter starts putting the glaze on the pot. And he circles that pot. He makes it nice and shiny. And he allows that pot to be fully glazed so it could be hardened even more. And many of us are saying, I don't like the glaze that God put on my life. I don't like the way I look in my life. I'm not happy with what he has developed me to be like. I'm not really satisfied with the glaze, the look of my pot. I don't care about the function of the pot. I know what I could be functioned to do. I just don't like the way I look. We look at the potter and say, do you understand what I am? Do you understand what I'm supposed to do? Why would you create me this way? And then the potter says, after I'm glazed, you know what he does again? He puts it back into a kiln. And he heats it up again. And you're saying, I thought I've already gone through this process. But the potter says, not yet. You are not ready yet. So after the process of the kiln again, he takes it out. He looks at it, and he says, Now, you have been made. You have been processed. You have been matured to do exactly what I've called you to do. You are my vessel. I have prepared you for a purpose. I have created you from scratch in order for you to fulfill what I need you to fulfill. You don't have that calling. All you have is the obedience of fulfilling what God has called you to do if we are willing to follow after that. So now we are a pot. We've been glazed. We've had the kiln. We've been fired, and now we're mature. Now we sit on the shelf of the pottery house, and now we are ready to be used whoever God wants us to use. So God takes us off the shelf and he says, I want you to be used in this way. So somebody comes in and we start using our gifts in a certain way. Maybe it's at our home. Maybe it's at the church. Maybe it's at school. Maybe something happens and somebody chips our pot, cracks our pot. What was once beautiful, what we thought was going to be used of God in a miraculous way, has now been scarred. My beautiful pot has been chipped. What I thought was going to be used of God in a mighty way cannot be used that way anymore. And sometimes we feel like that I'm just going to put myself on the back shelf and say, forget about life. Forget about all the things that God has in store for me. I can't be used. And God takes the broken parts of our life, the broken chips of our pot, and he says, oh no, no, no. I am not going to throw you away. I am going to masterfully fix that broken pot. 
or in some of your cases, that crack pot. I am going to fix your issues of life. And I'm going to allow your vessel, your pot, to be used in a mighty way. And you would say, how could that be? How could that be? I know that God created me to be me, to be a perfect person, to do what God wants me to do, but because of life, because of circumstances, because of individuals, my vessel, my life has been cracked. And I think I cannot be used of God the way that God orchestrated me and created me to be. And here's the greatest thing about God. God allows that cracked, that broken, that chipped vessel of our life. And he allows people, allows others to see your imperfections. And the greatest part about God's use of imperfections is nobody is perfect. Everybody has imperfections. It's easy to point out other people's imperfections, isn't it? It's easy to look at your, oh man, you got a crack pot. I can hide mine. I can try to hide mine. I can try to look around and try to put the facade on and act like I'm perfect. But you can see my imperfections. You can see my insecurities. And I can see yours. And the greatest thing about using our imperfections is this. When somebody is in need and somebody is struggling and somebody is hurting and somebody is almost on their way out of this world, and they are not happy, and they feel like the whole world is caving in on them. And you come alongside their life, and they see that you have imperfections. And they can say, can I talk to you? I notice that your pot, or your life, there's some cracks. There's some broken parts. It's not the perfect vessel. You've had things within your life to go wrong. How do you deal with that? And then God gets the glory. Because you can say, let me tell you, I was created by God in a perfect way to do something great. But things happen. Stuff happened. Sin happened. Problems arose. My life was cracked. But God loved me through it. And because God loved me through it, I didn't give up. I didn't quit. And now I am still being able to be used of God in a miraculous way because I'm just a vessel. Not my vessel. Not what I desire but I'm his vessel, what he desires. And all God has asked us to do with our vessel is to stay clean, to be able to be used of God, not to use our will, but to be used of his will, to keep our vessels clean enough so when people would look at us, they would see that we have issues within our life. We're not a perfect people, but we do have a relationship with Jesus and we are willing to share our faith and our life with others. Pottery. In Joshua chapter, or Jeremiah chapter 18, I'd like to read this, and I'd like to give you just a few points. And it, At the new year, this is a really neat story whenever you start thinking about what God wants to do within our life. The word which came to Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, Arise and go down to the potter's house, and there I'll cause you to hear my words. Did you hear that? And there I will cause you to hear my words. There are times within your life that God has orchestrated you to be at a certain place at a certain time for a certain word. And when God wants to teach you and to tell you something, it is not by circumstance or not by happenstance that you are at a place so that somebody is sharing something with you. God has orchestrated you to hear something that you need to hear. And I love when we hear something and it's opened our eyes and opened up a revelation that we can actually do what God wants us to do. So Jeremiah is called by God to come to this place and he says, and I will hear my words. And then I went down to the potter's house and there he was making something at the wheel. And the vessel that he made of clay was marred in the hands of the potter. So he made it again into another vessel as it seemed good to the potter to make. 
as it seemed good to the potter to make. The clay has no say, but the potter has all the say. And in your life, are we allowing God to make us become the person he wants us to be? Then, after he saw it, then the word of the Lord came to me saying this, O house of Israel, can I not do with you as this potter, says the Lord. Look at the clay in the potter's hand. So are you in my hand, O house of Israel. The instant I speak concerning a nation and concerning a kingdom to pluck up or to pull down and to destroy it, if that nation against whom I spoke turns from its evil, I will relent in the disaster that I thought to bring upon it. And the instant I speak concerning a nation, concerning the kingdom, to build it and to plan it, if it does evil in my sight so it does not obey my voice, then I will relent concerning the good in which I said I would benefit. What he's saying is, God is speaking to Jeremiah and said, Listen, do what I ask you to do. I have complete control. I have complete control over nations. I have complete control over a church. I have complete control over your individual life. So if you plan to do something bad, if you plan to not follow after my will, I have the authority to take that marred clay and to crush it and start over. But if you would relent, if you would repent, if you would say, I want to do what God wants me to do, God will smile and he will make us into who he wants us to be. It all depends upon who we see as in control of my life. Now, a chapter before that in Jeremiah chapter 17 is a beautiful picture. And it says in Jeremiah chapter 17, verses 7 through 10, it says this. Blessed is the man who trusts the Lord, whose hope is the Lord. For he shall be like a tree planted by the waters, which spreads out its roots by the river. And will not fear when heat comes, but the leaves will be green, and will not be anxious in the year of drought, nor will cease from yielding fruit. The heart is deceitful above all things and is desperately wicked. Who can know it? I, the Lord, searched the heart. I tested the mind, even to giving every man according to his ways, according to the fruit of his doing. We look our spiritual condition of do we sin? Do we have sin within our life? Do I have major issues within my life? I could tell you whether you're spiritual not because of you going to church and not because of how much Bible you know. We look at each other and we can see if somebody's spiritual because of the outward sin that they have within their life. But I want to tell you today as a church, sin is a byproduct of the problem. What we do on the outside is not the core issue. The core issue is what the potter is telling us here is the issue of the heart. It's the issue, do I love what God is doing within my life? Am I willing to be who God wants me to be? And if I am content in who God is and how God created me and what God wants to use me with, I will not allow the condition of the heart or the attitude of the condition of the heart to be one of arrogance or to be one of anger. I will say, Lord, I may not be like everybody else. I may not be as beautiful as other people. My vase or my pot may not be perfect like everybody else's, but I am willing to be used by you. Because you created me for a particular purpose. And my job and your job is to find out the will of God and the purpose of your life and not judge your life to someone else. Not judge your pot to somebody else's pot. Your plan to somebody else's plan. Let me tell you how you can have complete satisfaction and happiness and contentment is when you say, I am willing to do what he wants me to do. It may not be big. It may be gigantic. It doesn't make any difference. I am created for a purpose. And if I follow God's plan, and I fulfill his purpose, I am doing what I'm created to do. I get inner satisfaction, happiness, and contentment. But if I don't, if 
if I have all kinds of issues and impurities within my life, God is looking at it and he says, bam! He collapses us. And he says, I'm going to start over. I'm going to make you into who I need you to be. We, some of us, needed this New Year's resolution to start a new diet. Anybody start a new diet? Why? It's because I'm like the skit guys. Could you do the little chisel in a few areas? I'm, I'm happy with some areas, but I'm totally unhappy with other areas. So we want God to make us to be that perfect individual body. You know what? Studies have showed if you're 10 to 20 pounds overweight, you'll live longer anyway. So I'm, I'm living up to that, okay? I'm, I'm happy with that. So if that, but the ideal weight thing, isn't that stupid? The ideal weight, you're 5'10", your ideal weight's 160 pounds. I haven't been 160 pounds since I was in junior high. There's no way I'm going to be at an ideal weight. So if I could take 20 pounds on that, I could do the 190 thing. I, that's pretty good. Still considered obese for me, but I can deal with that. But, you know, we start the new year, and we say, this is what I want to become. I want to start over. I want to start over. I want to wipe the slate clean. But we have all of our life that has passed before us. All the mistakes, all of the issues, all of the problems, all of the scars. We're sitting here today, and we're saying, I want to start a new life. I want to start over. Wouldn't it be nice if we could go back and say, if I had this point of my life and I had one decision, one decision that I say I didn't make and I could make a different decision, if I could point back to one point in my life and not make that decision, how many of you guys could point that one decision and know exactly where you would go? My wife said, yeah, I got one. <laughs> August 10th. Yeah, I know exactly what day that is. So we could all make a decision and go back and say, if I didn't make that decision, my life would change. That decision could change our life. But that decision, those vehicles that we have taken in order to get to this point, that is who God has made us to be. God has orchestrated and allowed your life to take place to fulfill His will. So I'm going to say something as a pastor probably won't say a lot. Embrace your past, your sin. Accept it. Your victories, embrace it. But don't gloat in your sin, but don't take pride in your victory. Because if you gloat in your sin, we become prideful and arrogant of our flesh. And God cannot be lifted up and honored in our flesh. But if we are so arrogant because of our successes, then God can't use us without humility. So embrace where we've been. Accept who we are. Whether you have sinned, whether it's devastated your life, say, God, forgive me of where I've been. Let me be who you want me to be. Let me be used of God in a mighty way today. Embrace the past. Embrace the sin. Embrace the junk that you say I wish would never have taken place. You know, God does too. But God loves us so much that he doesn't want us to live in that sin. He wants us to embrace the forgiveness and the grace of God, to be used of God in a mighty way. But also, that sin keeps us from doing what God wants us to do. But the arrogance, the arrogance of success, of victory, of priority, of thinking that I'm better than others, that is sin and smells in the very nostrils of God. Because God wants a man and a woman with a humble heart that will say, I was created for a purpose. You, you, you are a pot. You're, you're just a vessel. You didn't have a say in the matter. I created you to be who you are. I allowed you to do certain things. It's not about you. It's not about what you can do. It's about what God allows us to do. Whether we're successful, give God the glory. Whether we have failed, ask God to forgive us and give God the glory of grace. 
But don't take arrogance and don't take flesh and take pride in those issues. Let me give you the points. I, that was my introduction. That was way too long. So now I'm just going to give you my points real quick. Number one, the first thing is God is the potter. God is the potter. God is in control. God created you. Allow him to be in charge of your life. Then man is the clay. You are the clay. You don't have a say in the matter. This new year, allow God to mold you and to make you who he wants you to be. Quit resisting. Allow him to do things for you. Allow him to do certain things for you. And then life is the will. Life is the will. And sometimes the will seems like it's out of control. But God cannot make the pot unless the will is in motion. And sometimes the will we feel like is out of control and I'm not happy. Man, too much chaos, so much stuff is going on. But allow God to control the speed of the will. Allow God to work within your life. And I love this about the pottery. Is as he's making the pot, there has to something be applied. There has to be moisture, water applied to the clay. The, the potter cannot make the pot to be who it needs to be unless there's water applied to that pot to keep it pliable. The water represents the Holy Spirit within our life, the Word of God within our life. If God is moving us, shaping us, we are not going to be able to become who God wants us to become unless we allow the Holy Spirit and the Word of God to apply within our life. We'll become rigid. We'll become angry. We'll become to the point where we say, I've not, I don't want God to do this. I don't like what's going on within my life. But when we allow the Holy Spirit to moisten us and to make us pliable, then we can say, oh, okay, God, I get it. I don't know what I'm going to become, but I'm going to be faithful to you until I become. I'm going to be faithful to you until you create me to who you want me to be. Life is the will. And then continued resistance brings the judgment of God. Continued resistance. Jeremiah went to the potter's house, and he was making a pot, and then there was mar, there was imperfection. So he started over. Imperfections represent pride or sin within our life. And there's times within our life that sin, that imperfection, maybe it's the lack of forgiveness or even the lack of gratitude towards God. Maybe it's the lack of relationships or maybe it's just issues within our life that it causes us to have internal, personal problems. And the Bible calls it mars, a marred pot, a scar, an imperfection. And sometimes those imperfections within that pot makes the pot worthless. So the potter has to start over. In our life, there are things within our life that God sometimes has to cut out of our life. Sometimes he has to take a scalper, a knife, and he has to cut out things within our life that causes that imperfections. Do we like that? No. We don't like it. But in order to be the pot that God wants us to be for the future, we have to endure the surgery of the day. We have to. Sometimes it's a recovery process. That's talking to a man sitting in the back row right now. Raise your hand. I'm talking to him. He just had heel surgery or tendon surgery. He has, he had, he's going to be in his crutches for a few weeks. He had to go through surgery in order to get better. He has to walk in a cast for weeks in order to get better. Any time that we have surgery, we have to go through pain in order to be healed, in order to be able to live a normal life. We understand that with our physical life. We understand that with our body. We understand that with cancer. We understand that with things. We have to go through the valley of pain in order to come out the other side. And we accept that with our body. But we do not accept that with our spiritual life. Oh, God will just forgive me. God will take care of that. No, God has to do surgery sometimes with us spiritually. And we don't like that. We rebel from the surgery of our spiritual life in order to be who God wants us to be. And in the pot, sometimes God has to take our pot and cause our pot to be pure. Sometimes he has to knock off some rough edges. But when we rebel 
against God's calling upon our life. Sometimes that brings judgment to God. And sometimes God has to break us and make us to become more like Him. And then God offers a new beginning to marred and ruined vessels. I really like this part. We have been created. We've been formed. We're fully mature. We've been in the kiln of life. We've been glazed. We've been set on a shelf. And like you, things happen. Stuff happens. Pains occur. Divorce happens. Child support happens, and we don't know how we're going to take care of it. We don't know what's going to happen within our life. We don't know what's happened financially. And you're looking at that and say, how can God still use me? If I would look, and if I was God, I would just find somebody else. I would just make a new pot, and I would bring somebody else in, and I would just make everything perfect because God can. But here's what God does. He says, I could do that. I could throw you away. I could open that window of the pottery house and I could throw you in the backyard and never use you again. I could do that because I have the power to do that. But here's what he does. He says, I want to offer to you forgiveness and grace. I want the world to know that you're mine. I want the world to know that I don't only use perfect people. Matter of fact, the Bible says he uses the simple things in this world to confound the wise, the broken things. He uses people that are uniquely gifted, that have issues within their life, that can bring glory and honor to God by using vessels that have scars, that's marred, that's cracked, because we understand what it's like not to be perfect. We understand what it's like to be on our knees before God and say, God, I'm done. My life as I know it, my life in which you started what I thought was going to be perfect, is ruined. What am I going to do? And we feel like we're going to throw everything away. We feel like nobody cares. We feel like we're all alone. We feel like my purpose is never going to be fulfilled. And then we get on our knees before God and say, Lord, I need your help. I need your forgiveness. I need your salvation. And God wraps his arms around us and he shows us that that crack in your pocket that scar on your pot is for glory to Him. And the thing that we tried to hide, the imperfections that we don't like, that we feel like is an embarrassment, is now something that God says, I'm going to use that. I'm going to use what you don't like to bring glory to what I like. And I love grace. I love forgiveness. I love restoration. I love my people who are called by my name to say, Lord, it's not about me anymore. If it's about me, I fail. It's about you, you succeed. How do we go into this new year? How do we allow God to change us? Is first, admitting I need him I fail every day I can't be in God's center of his will without his hand being on me and once I'm there I say Lord use me I don't want to hide I don't want to hide my imperfections I want to be honest to you I want you to forgive me of every place that I failed you and I want my imperfections my fears, my insecurities, my shortcomings to be something that God uses. And if He can use you in your state that you're in now, change you, 
forgive you, give you peace, give that inner satisfaction, give that happiness and that contentment for who you are and what you've done. And then he says, then I'm going to bring people around you that I need you to minister to. And I don't know if you've ever been there, but it happens a lot. When you feel like your purpose will never be fulfilled, you feel like that God somewhat is done with me because of sin that I've had or issues that I've gone through, and you feel like maybe maybe I failed God and maybe God isn't going to use me again. And then you humbly come before God and say, Lord, whatever I have left, whatever my issues are, whatever you can use of me, I'm yours. And then you'll see people. People that you did not think had issues just like yours. People that put the facade of life on to a point that you did not know that they had those issues will come up to you and say, I need to talk to you. I've noticed that you've gone through these issues. I notice you have these things, and I need you to help me. What God is doing right then, he puts a smile on his face, and he says, see, I created you for a purpose, for a plan. It's not about you. Embrace your past. Be humble about your victories, but be willing to say, I am his. That is how we can be a vessel unto use for the master's good work. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Father, Lord, we come before you. And Lord, we just thank you for creating us. Lord, we need you to forgive us. There are things within our life that, that we have failed you in miserably. But Lord, we all have sin. It's our nature as you created us. But Lord, forgiveness is offered to us. Allow us to embrace the grace and the forgiveness and to be used in a mighty way. Lord, protect us. As we offer up our prayers to you, forgive us where we have failed you. Allow us to be used by you for your plan and your we ask you that in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I'm going to ask Greg to make his way up here. Um, there's times in our services where we, we challenge and ask you to think about certain things. But there's other times at the end of a service, at the start of a new year, when I've, when I've asked you to contemplate your spiritual condition, your usefulness of God, what God is going to do or what God wants to do within your life. There's times in Jeremiah where he says, come to the house and let me show you something. Let me give to you something. I believe sometimes before we will ever change, there has to be an action. There has to be something within our life that compels us to a point, not that I enjoyed, but I'm under conviction. I think God wants to do something within my life, that I've got to do something. I have to be challenged. I'm not going to be able to sit in complacency and accept God to change me. I have to humbly say, Lord, I need you to change me. I want you to change me. I am not happy where I am spiritually. I'm not happy where I am emotionally. I'm not going to go through a coast mode of another year in complacency. What I want to do, Lord, is I want you to radically change my life. And the only way that he's going to do that is if you humbly come to him. And say, it's not my life. It's yours. I've got issues. I've got things that I have tried to deal with for years. And I have failed every day. But Lord, I want you to fix me. To radically change me. And then use me to bring glory and honor to you. If you're there, if you need a touch from God, If you need God to forgive you, to work within you, to give you that inner satisfaction spiritually, I'm going to invite you to come to the altar and talk to the potter and let him 
hear your hurt, your pain. Allow him to forgive you and start that transformation process today throughout the upcoming year. Will you please stand to your feet? As we sing this song, an invitation for you to respond to God's word and to God's call. Thank you.